about today are right triangles and trigonometry. We're going to look at sine, cosine, and tangent. We've already been working on this in class from the start, so that's fine. I want to go over it from the beginning now. There's a corny story that I told the other class, and they really didn't get a laugh out of it. So you need to appease me and laugh at me like it's actually funny. Okay? <laughs> and what it did for me when I was in school, I, I, rem I remember my class. And Mr. Lyman, 8th grade, Algebra 1, and at the end of the year, he started talking about triangles and trig, and we talked about this. He kind of like gave us a jump start for geometry. Now, he told the story, and it really is lame and corny, and it really doesn't make sense, but it helped me remember the acronym SOKOTOA. Okay? Now, SOKOTOA, as you know, is the ratio of sine, cosine, and tangent using the words opposite, hypotenuse, using the words adjacent, hypotenuse, and opposite and adjacent. You've probably seen these words already in class. So the story went as follows. And if you don't care, that's fine. If you haven't memorized, cool. But if it helps you, if there's any way to memorize, like that stupid hymn I sang before, where you probably didn't do much, but you might remember it later on, okay? So, here's how the story goes. <clears throat> so, as you know, Sokotoa relates the opposite, the adjacent and the hypotenuse legs of a triangle. So let's take a look at a triangle, please. Draw yourself a right triangle here. Let's call it triangle A, B, C. We'll give it a right angle, okay? And now, with this right triangle, what I would like you to do is to identify and look at B. Okay, let's look at B. And let's say we're given this length is three and this length is four. I'm gonna do it just with numbers for now, but I'm gonna talk about variables more tomorrow, but I want you to see what numbers first so we're all clear, okay? If I was looking at angle B, and I wanted to figure out its value, I need to start by identifying each of these legs with names. And my choices are adjacent, opposite, and hypotenuse. Which is the hypotenuse, and always which is the hypotenuse? The longest leg or the one opposite the right angle. Now, if I'm looking at angle B, at angle B, is... This opposite angle B, or is this opposite angle B? Four. The four, because you have to go opposite in the triangle. So let's call the four opposite. And again, this is with respect to angle B only. And then three becomes adjacent. What does adjacent mean in English? Next two. Next two. It's next to B, adjacent. Okay. Now, given that information, we have opposite which is 4, and adjacent, which is 3. What do we not have? We could find it if we want to. What is it? Because it's a 3, 4, 5 right triangle. For the sake of this, let's say we don't have it, okay? So that rules out which of the operations of trig that involve... Yeah, they're out. How come? They both involve each, or hypotenuse. So you know right away it's going to be tangent. Next. You start by writing the ratio of opposite over adjacent. What is that? And we said that's what tangent is, right? Yeah, yeah. Now, what angle is it? Angle B. So that's what my equation looks like from what we just did. The 4 over the 3 is opposite over adjacent, and the tangent is of that angle. Now, the next part is really weird, and it is not by any means mathematically correct, what I'm going to say. But I want you to think of it this way because it might help you remember, okay? If you had this equation on the top right of the screen, how would you solve for x? Divide by? Divide by? Five. five. So if you were to say in this part, you want to solve for b, think about dividing by 10. You're not dividing by 10. You're not. But think about that, OK? Next. What is the definition of division? The definition of division, Nick. Multiplication by the reciprocal. What's another word for reciprocal? Inverse. 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 So, on your calculator, isn't there a tan to the negative one button? Yeah. Yeah. If you press second tan, that's what the inverse tan is. So if it helps you remember to do the inverse, because you're not really dividing, but it's like you are, but you're not, you're not dividing. <laughs> press second tan, and press four divided by three. 
Because you're trying to get the angle by itself this time. With Miss Starks, you guys just used tan probably so far. We are trying to get the angle. So if you're confused, then pay attention because it might help in that. When you want to find an angle, you always use second tan or second sign or second cosine. Whenever you're looking for the angle. So press second, tan. It's going to open a parentheses for you. And then press four divided by three. Hit enter. You should get 53 point something. If you didn't, you're in the wrong mode. You might have to go to mode and change your mode on your calculator. Make sure that your mode is on degree and not radian. Okay, 53 point? 15. <coughs> unit? Nearest degree? Degree is the units. Degree is the units, people. Okay? That's how you find the angle. So you should be clear on that from class with Ms. Starks. Now, just to make you appreciate your calculator, here's how you can appreciate a calculator a lot. When I started in high school, there were no calculators. I know. You wouldn't think that would be so long ago, but it wasn't that far ago, long ago, right? So, in, you said there was an episode of this on Seinfeld? No, it's mad and smart. Wait, what? Uh, what? Things said Seinfeld. So, nothing, nothing. Sign value. This is Seinfeld. So, what I used to have to do is this. You used to have to find out whatever the ratio is. So, what's 4 divided by 3? Check on your calculator. 4 divided by 3. 7.33. Alright. Then you would have to use what's called the trig table. And a trig table would look like this. A trig table would have a bunch of numbers. Oops. Okay. Okay, this would be whatever this was here, the inverse, and it would say something like this. Okay, and what you would do is you would find a function and find that value. Where is 1.33333? It's between these, isn't it? Yeah. So what you would have is something like this. This would probably be like... Maybe something like that. And you would have to say, well, the value we were looking for is somewhere between here. So the angle... Oh, sorry, was it 53? Yeah. Sorry. You get the idea, right? Okay. So you'd have to what's called interpolate the data. You'd have to say, let me find that fraction, go to the tan column, figure out which degree it is, something in between, and it's around 53, 53 degrees. Your calculator uses built-in functions to do this for you, but this is what you used to do. And I'm gonna, I'll bring it a book so you can see what it looks like, just so you appreciate your calculator. We'll never have to do this. Never. But I want you to, just like before I talked about with that Newton method with the like tangent lines and stuff, to find those roots or those x-intercepts, same thing, okay? You're going to use some sort of an algorithm in your calculator, but it happens instantaneously. All right? Anyhow, that was a side note for me. Let's move on. What am I going to draw? Stay with me. Stay with me. Draw a wall like this on the right side. That's the wall of the room. Next. Draw a force acting at some angle. on the wall. Draw a dot where the force begins to show that it's like a ray. We're going to use the word vector, but let's say for now it's a ray. Draw an x and y axis that go through the origin at the dot. And make it dashed in your mind. Eventually you're going to do this all in your head. You're going to have to draw this stuff out like the x and y axis. Next, you've heard of the word theta. Theta is spelled T-H-E-T-A. I thought for four years in math it was called theta, like feta cheese. And I realized that on the June regions of like junior year of high school, after learning it this way for like four years, that it was theta and not theta. Really stupid on my part, I know. So, it's called theta. It looks like this. Okay, it is not this symbol. That is an empty set or no solution. It is the first one. 
Okay, it is not the second one. It is not that symbol. It's theta. But did you think of it as theta? Yeah. So I thought I'd correct it now in case anyone else did what I did in high school. My teacher pointed it out to me, actually. So, at this point in time, theta is always an angle measurement. Theta in physics is the angle here. Okay, whoops. Angle here. Okay? So write this in words. Theta is the angle between the x-axis and the vector. Theta is the angle between the x-axis and the vector. Now, here's what I want to make a point of. We've talked about vectors already, whether you realize it or not. We said displacement was a vector, but distance was not. We said that velocity was a vector, but the speed was not. So what was the difference? Does anybody remember between a vector and a non-vector, which in a minute we'll call a scalar? Okay, so like that vector is only had an arrow pointing only one way. So I guess a non-vector would be going two ways. No, is it the opposite? Wait, sorry, can you give me the question? I'm gonna go over the answer because we're running out of time and you should listen the first time. Normally I wouldn't like, but we need to keep going. A vector from class we mentioned has some sort of value and a direction to it. For example, displacement could be five meters or it could be negative five meters. The negative or the positive indicates the direction. Velocity positive means to the right. Velocity negative means to the left. That's a vector. What about speed though? Speed didn't matter which direction. Distance, it doesn't matter which direction. It's just a number, five <laughs> meters. So a vector has a a vector has a magnitude and direction. Magnitude, M-A-G, and direction. Okay, a scalar has just a magnitude. Speed Distance traveled, those are scalar quantities. Because if I said to you, how far did you go from home to school? You might say, well, I walked up five blocks this way, two over and seven more. So that's a total of 14 blocks. But your displacement, remember, is directly from A to B. It's not taking the path. So distance and speed are scalar quantities because I don't care the direction you took. But a vector, S-C-A-L-A-R. But a vector, it does matter, the direction. So in trig, you use angles. In this class, we're going to use angles. Here's your example of why this is important. Every time you do something in life, it's going to be at an angle. People think that a lot of things are flat. Most things are at angles, whether you realize it or not. For example, if you're pulling your little brother or sister in like a wagon at the park, that little cord is at an angle, isn't it? Yeah. So even though you're pulling them this way, you're pulling up and out. If you were leaning against the wall, just casually, you might say I'm leaning horizontally. But really, look at my arm. Isn't it at an angle? There's an angle right here. Here's the horizontal x-axis. Here's the negative angle. If I were to be pushing down, here's the angle. Here's the x-axis here. Here's the angle here. So everything is at an angle. So we need to break them up into their components. So if I wanted to hold this eraser against the wall, okay, because it's so light, I could just apply a very light force against the wall and friction helps me. But if it were really heavy, I'd probably hold it like this, right? Push up on it also and hold it up. Or if I wanted to move this desk, I might lift above the ground first. Why would I do that? What does that help me with? Reduce the... So you end up pulling at an angle. And pull it at an angle. Everything's at an angle. So we have to start looking at vectors and in chapter 3, we talk about projectiles. And they're launched. So they're launched. Imagine you kick a football. Does that go horizontal usually? No. Which way does it go? Uh, Diagonal or horizontal and vertical. Right? Follow the path of the vector on the board. It will make a parabola over time. If it lands, if it were a projectile. 
So in section 3.3, we're going to be talking about this. We're going to be talking about projectiles and angles. So we're going to go into vectors. For now, this is where I left off in the other class. Okay? So a vector has a number, like 3.5 meters per second, but has a direction at an angle of 30 degrees. And we're going to break it into components, and look at the y direction, look at the x direction, and put it all back together. Hold on, Scott and Zanna first. Yeah, uh, so this is your general. Guys, this is Scott. Your general introduction yes. To velocity. Yeah, tomorrow we're going to talk more about how this is going to apply to what we're learning with velocities and vectors, and forces and vectors, and then we'll move on to section 3.3, which is projectile motion. That's like our longest section of the year. Probably spend a good amount of days on that section. Okay? Camila. So vectors, displacement, and velocity are vectors? Vector is, good examples of vectors are displacement and velocity. Good examples of scalars are distance and speed. What do you mean by magnitude? Magnitude is the quantity. So Mike, if you were running at 7 meters per second, the magnitude is 7 meters per second, and then if it said east, the direction is east. Oh, okay. Okay? So I'll give an example below here so you can see. Um, yes, Ev? <laughs> Everything's unrealistic, yeah, for sure. I mean, whatever, I'm not... Yeah. So 35 newtons, that's a force, newtons, at 25 degrees southeast. Okay, so the magnitude is this, the direction is this. If you only have the magnitude, it becomes what's called a scalar. 35 newtons, 35 newtons by itself is a scalar. With the direction, it's a magnitude. And for newtons. So three meters would be the magnitude. Southeast. 35 at. So like if you were just giving three meters, That's why displacement, we have a tendency to say positive or negative. Because it's really east or west or north or south. You're giving direction when you give a positive and negative. Okay? I will pick up this tomorrow. So again, if I shine a flashlight from the left-hand side over here, and I shine the flashlight like that, so it was shining, what would happen is you would see a shadow from here all the way to here. That would be what the projection would be from a flashlight on the left. If I shine... Straight above or straight below. Not, what does that tell us? I'm going to explain it. Just stay with me for a moment. If I shine this from above, okay, same thing. I shine a flashlight from above like that. The shadow, right, the shadow would show up right below it from there to there, which is like your leg of the triangle that we've been talking about. Okay, so we have the two legs of the triangle are like those shadows that you see. Those are the components of force that we're going to be looking at in a moment. Which simply means that if I wanted to know how much I'm pushing in the y direction, I could measure the length of this side of the triangle and it tells me. So for example, what was one of our special right triangles that we know? Who knows one of the special right triangles? Three, four, five. Okay, three, four, five. What's another one? Because we did that one yesterday. What was the other one? That is a type of right triangle, but the legs, the legs. The Pythagorean triples. 5, 12. There it is, 13. So let's say this was 5, 12, 13. Here's what this means. Take a look at the board. If I apply a force of 13 newtons at this specific angle, I'm really applying a vertical force of 12 and a horizontal force of 5. Because it's in parts. Again, again, when I push on the wall over here, it's at an angle. I'm pushing into the wall with 5 newtons. I'm pushing up, like straight up in the vertical direction, with 12 newtons. So the legs of the triangle are what give me the corresponding components of the force. And the same idea applies for velocity. We've been talking about if an object moves only in the X or only in the Y. Well, what if I punt the football and it follows this path? Part of my velocity is in the X because it's moving this way, right? But isn't the football also moving upward? So there's also part of the velocity in the y direction. These projections, 12 and 5, indicate what the velocity would be if the angle were whatever we had here. So if I kicked it with a velocity of 13 meters per second at this given angle, and I knew these side lengths, those would give me the values of the velocity in each direction. 
This would be what's called my Y component of force or velocity or whatever it is. And this would be my X components. Okay? The X and the Y components. Reese? Would it be pushing like downwards like that? Then it's a negative Y component. And if you're pushing left, it would be a negative X component also. So, so right now, this is both negative X. Yeah. So watch. If I push this way, you guys can tell me. Tell me what's... Raise your hand. If I'm pushing, let's say, this way. Am I negative X or positive X? Negative. Positive. Negative Y. You're pushing to your... Left. Negative Y because I'm pushing down. But aren't I putting... Oh, in your, from your perspective. Sorry. Oh. Oh. From your perspective. Positive X because it's to the right. But the minute I push this way, it's negative X, isn't it? If I push down, it's negative Y. If I push up like this, hmm, I shouldn't do that. If I push up in the air like that, nobody? Okay. If I push up in the air like that, okay, what happens is when I push up against the wall, I'm pushing in the positive Y, but in the negative X, as opposed to the other direction. Okay, so what we're going to do now is come up with a way to generalize this whole thing. So you don't have to memorize all the stuff we've been talking about. We'll come up with a way that gives us an answer every time. Okay, helps us come up with like a, an algorithm, if you will. Okay, an algorithm. So to do that, let's do just a triangle. Now, call the hypotenuse, for the sake of this, call it F. For force. F1 or just F. So we've got a force applied at some angle... We'll call that angle theta again. Remember, we always look at the angle between the x-axis and the actual vector. Okay, the hypotenuse is the vector in this case. If I wanted to know what the length of these sides are, I could use Sokotoa to do this. So, for example, call this the y component, call this the x component, and do it this way, actually. Call it with a subscript. Call it f sub y and f sub x. You've seen subscripts in chemistry with numbers indicating the amount of atoms that make up a molecule, right? So H2O is two hydrogen, one oxygen. But for this example, this X and this Y, those are not numbers. They're not giving you an amount. It's telling you the component you're looking at. So this is like the X component or the horizontal. This is the Y component or the vertical. Now, in order to figure those values out, we have to start using Sokotoa. How can I write a relationship between this side length here, this hypotenuse, and this angle. Think about Sokotoa, and if I wanted to write some relationship with these three variables here, what would it say? What would it say? Scott? Well, it would be adjacent and hypotenuse. So adjacent hypotenuse, so good. Cosine of theta equals adjacent, which is? F over Fx. Yep. I mean, F, Fx over Fx. Good. Again, from yesterday and from your class in math so far, you've learned that the cosine function represents the adjacent side, which is fx, over the hypotenuse, which is just f in this case. So far, so good? Okay, now leave yourself some space and write down the next part for sine of theta. What would the sine of theta be? Mike? Would it be fy over fx? I mean, fy over fx. Yeah. Opposite, so again, sine, sine is opposite over hypotenuse, so it would be Fy over F. Fy over F. Okay? If you're, if you're having trouble with this, please stop me and ask a question at this point. So again, we're just writing out our trig ratios. For now, I'm going to leave the tangent alone. Okay? Just for a moment, leave the tangent alone. We'll go back to that and see where that comes up. It's not going to come up in this part. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to solve for fx. How would you get rid of the f? Uh, multiply. multiply both sides by f. So what does this become when you multiply everything by f? Cool of theta uh, times f. I'm going to write it the other way. f times cos theta equals fx. Okay, good. So again, if I were to solve for fx, that's what it would say. I would move the f up. Move the f variable upward over here. It's multiplied by cosine theta, and that would equal fx. Same thing down here, do please. Solve for fy. Oh. 
Helen, stop distracting them. So we have the two relationships here that represent Fx and Fy. And this is actually all we have to do to come up with our governing rule. And here's what we're just going to say. So once you have this written down, you should look up. Okay? Because I want you to see what I'm going to point to and show. <coughs> here's what we want to say. If you ever want the x component, all you need to do is take the original, whatever is it, it is, in this case f, the original force that was given, and multiply that by the cosine of theta. Always, always, always. Again, this is assuming that theta is between the flat or the horizontal axis and the vector. It's got to be that way. If theta was up here, say you put theta here by accident, okay, say you put theta there, it would switch then. You would use sine instead of cosine. So just to make it easier, so we can just remember cosine goes for x, and in a minute we're going to say this now, sine goes for y. Just to make it easy on us, make sure your theta is not drawn there. Okay? Stay with the theta the way we showed yesterday. So whenever you want the y component of something, just take whatever the original value is and multiply it by the sine of the angle theta, where theta is the angle between the horizontal and the vector given. Okay? The horizontal and the vector given. Excuse you. All right. Now, x and y. That's the sine and the cosine component. So let's take a look now at a problem that says the following. Okay, let's take a look at a problem that says the following. An object is fired with an initial velocity of 12 meters per second at 38 degrees northeast. Find the components of the velocity. Which of them will change over time? An object is fired with an initial velocity of 12 meters per second at 30 <coughs> degrees northeast. Find the components of the velocity. Which of them will change over time? So start, please, by drawing yourself a little quick diagram. And it's very simple to draw this out. Simply put a dot. Draw an angle of around 38 degrees. You can estimate, obviously. And call this VI. Okay? So start with your dot there. You have your vector coming from it. Draw your horizontal line. Put your 38 degree angle in there. And put your VI up top. Showing that that's the initial velocity. Now, if you use the formula we said a moment ago, you can find each of those components. So what are we trying to do here, really? Well, the object is fired at an angle. So part of it is going to the right, and part of it is going up. But it's happening at the same time, so you don't see that. Okay, again, an object is launched like this, so I'm going to the right, but I'm also going up in the air. And then I'm coming down from the air, but I'm still going to the right. So there's vertical motion, and there's horizontal motion. So we need to find what's called VIX and VIY. Just like a minute ago we found FX and FY, we're going to do the same thing. So if I want to find VI, the velocity in the X, and then VI, the velocity in the Y. What did I say a moment ago when you want to find the components? What do you do for each of these? For the X, what do you have to do? For the X, Bobby? It's original. <coughs> the original, which is just VI times... Cosine of theta. Very good. For the VIY, we said the original, which again is VI, times the sine of theta. Well, you have these numbers. You're given them in the problem. So go ahead and plug them in and see what you get. It's going to be 12 cosine 38. 12 sine 38. We 
What does that mean, the positive version? Well, like you said, you know, like instead of uh, like when you use second and then sign negative one. Why are you doing second sign? No, I'm not. I'm oh, oh, you don't use the second yeah. command. Correct. Very good, man. I thought you meant positive versus negative answer. So on the left side, what do you do? Just leave it that way? Here? Yeah, why don't you write VI before the Because it's the initial velocity, because in a moment we're going to talk about how one of them changes over time. So then you're going to have to determine why. We might use it for the final velocity in a moment, yeah. What do you get as a number for VIX? What does it get when you do 12 times the cosine of 38? 9.5. And what about the y direction? 7.4. You haven't learned this yet, but it might be useful. So if you want to listen to this fun fact, you can write it down also. You'll learn it this year. If the angle, if the angle is less than 45, the x component will get more of the velocity. You see this? How it gets more of the velocity? 9.5 for the x direction, 7.4 for the y direction. If the angle is bigger than 45, okay, the y velocity will get more of the component than the x will. So x will be bigger if it's less than 45? Yeah. If it's less than 45, VIX will be bigger than VIY. If it's greater than 45 degrees, vice versa. The angle is less than 45? Yeah. If the angle is exactly 45, and you're going to talk about this in a lab, they're equal to each other. Okay? If the angle is exactly 45 degrees, if they had been 45 degrees, these would have been the same answer. You can check. Okay? So try the sine of 45, try the cosine of 45. They're both 0.7071. So no matter what, you're taking 0.7071, which is this number, this approximation, times whatever your VI is, so they'd be the same. Okay, they're both the same if it's 45. So, um, Scott? VI was Is what? 12 times the sine of 38. Yes. Now, do me a favor real quick, everybody. Do the following. Ready? Take your calculator. Type in the following. 7.4 squared plus 9.5 squared. Hit enter. You should get around 144, I hope, right? Okay, what's the square root of 144? So if you took the square root of your answer, you should get back to what you started with initially. Because you're using Pythagorean theorem, really. <coughs> Think about this. You've made a right triangle that looks like the following. Here's the right triangle you've made. The x was 9, 5. The y was 7, 4. And this was 12. That's kind of what you've done right here. Okay, so whenever you want to check to see if you did it right, you can go back and do Pythagorean theorem to see that you get the right answer. And it's going to be approximately off because of the rounding that we took, took part here. Okay, it's clearly not 9.5 exactly or 7.4 exactly. Is there like a certain amount of like error that like, goes over a certain thing? Say it's like 5 over, or is it always like 1 or 2? It's always going to be dependent on what the initial number is, Mike. Right. If, if these numbers were different, if they were larger or smaller, it would impact the amount of error. Okay. The error is a function of the value or the value you put in. So I can't it's answer really that. No. Exactly. We'll talk about percent error, yeah. Percent error is pretty simple. Yeah, a few of your labs are going to have percent error, absolutely. So what we're going to do is we're going to use labs to measure the acceleration of gravity. You know how it's negative 9.81 meters per second squared? We're going to do a lab that proves that. So you might get like negative 9.9. .9. So we'll look at percent error there for sure. Because we know what the accepted value is of negative 9.81. Okay, so if you wanted to take something far, uh -huh. rather than high... You would kick it at a lower angle. Okay. But... That's like just theoretical, though. That's not theoretical. like air resistance. Let's talk about this. This is a really good point you're making. Before you get to that, though, give me one second, okay? So we can talk about this next part. And I'll get back to that. We're going to talk about that. Just hold on. Now, the next part says the following. Which of them will change over time? When does velocity change? And think about the answer before you answer. When will a velocity of an object change if there is blank present? If what is present to cause velocity to change? Gravity. Gravity. Sure. Give me general term. 
Acceleration. Right? Isn't gravity acceleration? Okay? So if acceleration is present, then the velocity of an object will indeed change. Well, in the vertical direction, gravity is present. Agreed? So there's some acceleration. So VIY starts out at 7.4. But what's going to happen is, as it follows its path, its velocity is going to change. And you can see that. Just watch. Everybody look up. Watch my hand. Positive velocity, positive in the Y. Positive velocity, positive velocity, positive velocity. Technically, it stops here in the Y direction for a moment. Even though it's still moving left to right, it pauses and then it starts to fall back down to negative, 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 negative Y, negative Y, more negative Y. So there's definitely acceleration present in the Y direction because of gravity. But in the X direction, what we want to do is make the assumption that there's no acceleration present. The only acceleration that would really be involved in the X would be air resistance. But as I mentioned to you guys last class, taking into account air resistance makes the course a, pretty much like a calculus-based physics course. And they're not even doing that in AP Calc just yet. Okay? So that's the kind of thing that you have to wait until you learn more about calculus until we can evolve air resistance. So what we say for these problems is that air resistance is approximately negligible. Okay? Negligible. So the x component of velocity will not change because there's going to be no acceleration in the x. So this value is consistent throughout. So if you wanted to know what the vf is, in the x direction it's still 9.5. In the y direction it's not. In the y direction it will change because there's acceleration due here. Okay? Mike? So at the stop it you said like it changes from At the top? Yeah. Vy at the max is zero. Vx at the max is still 9.5. That is not changing whatsoever. There's a really good, I gotta pull up the video, I'm bringing it in maybe next class. There's a good illustration of this. As the projectile moves, it shows the vectors on it and shows how they're changing. So here's what it would look like. I can, I can illustrate Teresa's comment. If a projectile were launched and it followed that path, and we looked at five instants in time, Okay? Five instants in time. What well, you notice is that the velocity here is, first of all, the velocity on a curved path is always what's called tangent to the curve. So this is the velocity at part A, that's the velocity at B, that's the velocity at C, that's the velocity at D, and that's the velocity at E. Okay? So those arrows are indicating the direction of motion. So if you look at them, and you just look at them clearly, You'll see that in the beginning, it's in an angle, right? So there's definitely x and y in the beginning. There's vy, and this is vx, okay? Again, making a triangle. And you could draw it on this side. You could put your vy over here if you want to make a triangle, make it more obvious. But this would be your vy, and this would be your vx. And this is the actual velocity. But what you'll notice is as it goes further and further up, look what happens to vx now. Look how long vx is suddenly. And what happened to vy? It got shorter until you get to the top. Is there any Vy at the top at all? No, because no, the velocity vector is all to the right. And then as you go further, you'll notice now here's Vx, still positive to the right, but what's Vy? Vy is negative. And finally at the end, it should be at an angle really still. It should kind of be at an angle, the original. Let me draw an angle so it's more clear. Okay, so we still have a little bit of Vx here and a whole lot of Vy right there. Okay, I know it's hard to see that. I'll move it up. So for this kind of a problem, what I want you to notice is that as the object moves along its trajectory, the velocity components will vary. The Vx will remain the same the entire time. So in the beginning here, Vx is some number. It's going to be the same value the whole way through. Vx is not going to change even though it looks like the vector length is changing for these. Vx doesn't actually change. Okay, but Vy is going to change along the way. We make the assumption that Vx doesn't change simply because we say that there is no air resistance in the x direction. Okay, that's the only reason that that is true. But what I want you to notice at the top is that Vy at the max is always going to be zero. Vx at the max is whatever it was. It's a constant, it's not changing. So if I started the problem with 9.5 for Vx, like we did in the last one, 
All of these VXs are 9.5. But VY changes. 7.4, then maybe like 5.2, then VY is 0, then negative 5.2, then negative 7.4. Noting the symmetry in the problem. Okay? Now, Mike, go ahead. Yeah, and that's, that's you're like reading my mind. I was about to say, what would this path look like if there was air resistance now? And that's what you're saying, Mike. As there is air resistance in real life, the path actually follows something like this. Okay, it's like a skewed parabola. It starts to change. It is not really symmetric. So what you'll notice is it won't go as far because of air resistance, and there won't be really an axis of symmetry because the symmetry does not exist when there is air resistance. Okay? Scott, then back to Reese with your question. Okay, so say if it was a football, and when it hits the floor, if it bounces, does that mean x is greater than gravity for, for it to bounce? No, the bouncing has to do with the elastic potential energy of the object, which we haven't even talked about, so I wouldn't worry about bouncing just yet. No, no, it's a good question, Scott, very good. But just, I'm going to say hold off on it. It has to do with the elasticity and the height it started at. There's a lot of other variables involved. But we'll talk about that for sure. We're going to talk about conservation of energy and that will come up.